Sigma Club. Sigma Club, we're told, was founded on the sound principles of character and integrity. But I believe that it is Sigma Club's illustrious members through the years that have shown clearly that the foundations of the club were indeed well thought out. Through the years, they have rendered invaluable service to the university community, as we have seen with the endowment of a scholarship and an essay competition. We must also commend the contributions of all Sigmites, many of whom have made tremendous contributions to our nation and to mankind. And we commend them today, even as they celebrate the 68th anniversary of their illustrious and distinguished club. Congratulations indeed. I'm to speak on the topic developing the nation through youth empowerment. And let me say that there is no other way, really, of developing our nation without youth empowerment, or put differently, without creating jobs and opportunities for young people. And this will become clearer as we set the context. I want us to pay a bit of attention because there are several figures and several statistics that we'll be using. But because this is a university, uh, we are going to uh, have to engage on, on that level a bit. And I think the university community is an important place for us to analyze policy, for us to look deeply at some of the issues that concern our nation. The social media cannot do it for us. The social media, as you know, uh, cuts bits and pieces of what may sound interesting. But I think that the university community is really the best place for us to take a good hard look at some of what we are seeing in our country, why we are where we are, and what we need to do to move forward. Nigeria is Africa's most populous country. And like the rest of the continent, it is a nation of young people. Half of the population is below the age of 20. By the year 2050, we will be the world's, the world's third most populous country, exceeded only by India and China in that order. 60% of that population will be made up of young people. And these young people must have jobs or opportunities to make a decent living. And of course, they require training to cope with the emerging knowledge and technology driven economies which we are bound to see in the coming years. As a matter of fact, already the competition across the world is one that is based on knowledge and innovation. And that competition is so because we now live in a completely globalized environment. There is no longer, it is no longer possible to see Nigeria as a country just within its own borders. All the opportunities that we're seeing today are opportunities that cut across borders and cut across even our own local experiences. So we must think globally. And in, in our planning and in our thinking, we must, we must be looking at how to deal with all of the issues that have arisen globally. But let's backtrack a little to give some background to where we are today. And I'll share with you some of the Nigeria Bureau of Statistics include, and the World Bank on the numbers of poor people that have been in Nigeria since 1980 and bring ourselves up to date. And I want to set the context because it's important for us to understand the enormity of the problems that we're dealing with and how exactly to tackle those problems. In 1980, we had 17.1 million persons who were said to be living in extreme poverty. These are persons unable to afford the basics, food, shelter, and clothing. By World Bank standards, persons who are unable to afford anything beyond $1.90 a day. In 1985, that number became 34.7 million, a jump, as you can see, from 17 million. In 1992, the number became 39.2 million. In 1996, the number became 67.1 million. In 2004, the number became 68.7 million. And in 2010, the number became 112.47 million. 
a jump of close to 40 million persons between 2004 and 2010. Now, today, the MBS is still doing the latest in what is called this household survey of poverty. So we don't have the latest in that five-year cyclical figure. But as of 2010, we had 112.47 million extremely poor people. So in 1996, there were an estimated 61.7 million people. I'm just going, looking back at those statistics. In 2004, we saw that the number moved up to 68 million. And by 2010, that number, as we've seen, literally doubled. What happened between 2004 and 2010? How come the poverty number doubled between 2004 and 2010? From 60, from as you can see, 67.1 in 2004 to 112.47 in 2010. What happened? Now what is astonishing, and we'll, 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 as we go along we'll, we'll discover what it is, but what is astonishing? about the poverty situation is that it persisted even when the nation earned its highest revenues. The nation was earning between 2004 and 2010, those were the periods when the nation earned one of its highest revenues. Between 2010 and 2014 are probably the highest. But the highest all revenues were within that period. And poverty numbers continued to increase and even doubled. Now let me give you a, a sense of our oil earnings also from 1999 to date, just so that we understand exactly how much money we're talking about. And we can compare that with the poverty numbers. Between 1990 and 1998, we earned from oil. I'm looking at oil alone. There's, of course, taxes and, and all other you know, sources of earnings. Between 1990 and 1998, we earned $119.8 billion. Between 1999 and 2009, we earned $481 billion US dollars. But between 2010 and 2014, a period of just four years, 2010 and 2014, we earned $381 billion. More than we earned, in the 10-year period, 1999 to 2009. More than we earned in the period 1990 to 1998. In four years, 2010 to 2014, we earned 381 billion naira. Between 2015 and today, we have earned 112 billion dollars. Not naira, I beg your pardon. All of this is dollars. Between 2015, June, and today, we have, earned, we have earned 112 billion US dollars. Now, take the period between 2010 and 2015. For most of that period, as we've seen, Nigeria enjoyed an oil boom, with oil prices hovering around $100 to $114 per barrel. This is the period when we've earned the highest from oil in any period in our nation's existence. But during that period, our external reserves fell to $30 billion by the end of 2014. The number of out-of-school children as of 2015 was 10.3 million. And in that period, we piled up the highest debt in our nation's history. Let me give you the figures of the total debts, local and foreign, for federal government and the states from 2010 to date. In 2010, our, our debt was, I'll, I'll leave out the fractions, 2010, our debt was $35 billion in 2010. 2011, it became $41 billion. 2012, it became $48 billion. 2013, it became $64 billion. 2014, uh, 2013, it was $64 billion. 2014, $67.7 billion. 2015, $63.8 billion. 2016, $57.3 billion. 2017, $70 billion. And 2018, it is $73 billion. Now, what do these figures show? From 2010 to 2014, where we had the highest, where, where we had our highest earnings, 
borrowing was going on despite the very high earnings. As a matter of fact, we were borrowing very heavily because we moved from 35 billion in 2010 to 63 billion in 2014, almost double, you know, uh, uh, about almost 30 billion naira more. Now, that as of the t as of 2015, we were already at debts of 63 billion. Today we are at 73. Now, it's important for us to understand that what is it exactly? that accounts for a situation where you are earning a lot and you are still not providing the jobs, you are borrowing children out of school. Why is that the case? Let me explain very quickly, and this is what you know, I've described as the paradox of high growth figures and rising poverty and unemployment. The first is that high oil revenues do not necessarily translate to jobs. That's the first thing I think we, we need to understand. Because the oil industry by itself simply doesn't produce enough jobs. It produces very few jobs by itself as an industry. Of course, to make it produce jobs, we need to go into, uh, we, we, we certainly need to go beyond just producing oil and selling oil. And, and that really is a challenge by itself. But it's very important to understand that the oil industry by itself simply doesn't pro provide enough jobs. So the high revenues can only translate to jobs and better living standards if the revenues are invested and there is some measure of diversification of the economy. Of course, infrastructure, education, healthcare, and social protection for those who cannot work. The question, of course, is what happens to these revenues? What happened to the revenues? The most important drain on our public resources is grand corruption. The most important drain on our public resources is ground corruption. That's the most important drain. When you look at the stealing of public funds, the large amounts of public funds that are stolen, you, better under, you will then be able to better understand what, why it is that despite high revenues, very little progress is made. And I refer to grand corruption because grand corruption, and I'll explain what grand corruption is, because it's different from corruption that is contract related. Contract related corruption is sort of corruption where somebody gives out a contract and some public official takes a percentage of that contract. But I'm talking here, when I talk about grand corruption, I'm talking about directly stealing from the treasury. That is to say, without necessarily doing any contracts at all, simply, the, 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 simply going to the treasury, the highest levels of government, and with wrong money, and spending it, privatizing it, stealing it in short. Now that is the kind, that is the kind of thing I think that we really need to pay attention to in particular. Because that is the essence of state capture. It is a heinous phenomenon that makes it possible for a country to have resources, huge resources, and yet not be able to benefit its people at all. And I'll give you an example, just, you know, uh, just to un better understand what I'm talking about. Today we're doing a scheme called Trader Money, and I'm going to talk about it as we go along. Now that scheme is one where we're giving traders these are petty traders, the lowest, you know, in the, in the pyramid. Persons who are hawking and, you know, doing petty trading. We're giving two million petty traders the total sum of 20 billion. That's the total sum. So two million petty traders are going to benefit from this. Most of them, their inventory, what they sell on their trades is not more than 3,000 naira. So when you look at you know, when you look at some of these very small traders, you know that really what they, what they require isn't very much. So we start with giving 10,000. When they pay back, you give 15, then you give 20, and it goes on like that until about 100,000. But that is 20 billion Naira only. 20 billion Naira only for 2 million people. Now, in one transaction, in one transaction that took place in 2014, 60 billion naira 
was withdrawn from the pub, from the treasury, and we do not know where, what happened to it. It simply disappeared. Now, when you compare that to 20 billion naira for 2 million traders, you can imagine what can be done with 60 billion. It's just three times more. That's 6 million people. And that's just part of it. And in another transaction, 292 million US dollars simply was embezzled. 292 million US dollars in one transaction. 10 million US dollars is 3.6 billion. So you can imagine what kind of money we're talking about. This is what I refer to as grand corruption. I think it's very important for us to bear in mind that no nation on earth can possibly prosper when its, when, when its resources, when the commonwealth is fleeced in that manner. And this is the whole issue. This is the point. No matter how you slice it, if resources of the country are looted in the way that they were looted, it's, in, it's almost impossible for the country to make progress. No matter how you slice it, you can, you can say, you can, we can argue from now till eternity. You and I know that if your, resource, if your personal resources are stolen, you, you're poor. That's how it works. And I think that it's important for us to keep ensuring that we do not miss that point. Because it's possibly, and, and in my few years in the public service of this country as vice president, I have seen that were we to be able to deal with that problem, the problem of grand corruption, which is really one of the major issues we've tackled as a government, the resources available to us will be tremendous. That is why it is possible, for example, that today, and as you've seen from the figures, we are earning 60% less than was earned in the period 2010 to 2014, 60% less. And yet, we are spending 2.7 trillion on capital, the highest in the nation's history. Why? You can do more with less if you don't steal the money. That's how it works. You can do more with less if the money is still in your hands. That's how it works. And I want to say, and I want to say that flowing from that, and I've said that no economy can survive if there's a theft of its commonwealth. The third point, of course, is that you cannot invest in infrastructure and the creation of an enabling environment for business. And this is what we've seen through the years. Because we've lacked the resources the quantity of resources required to invest in infrastructure. Investments in infrastructure were not made. You cannot develop an economy where you don't have investments in rail, in roads, in power. You cannot. It just won't work. No matter what anybody says, no matter how they want to make it sound, it is simple common sense. The fourth is the lack of commitment to diversification of the economy which would in turn provide multiple streams of income. And we've seen this time and time again. So let us just go quickly to what then is the plan to provide enough jobs, to build a country where young people will find the opportunities, will find the jobs, and can make progress. There is no nation on earth that is built by just a group of people called its leaders. Everybody must pay attention. Everybody must pay attention. If you don't pay attention, you will find that our, our future is lost. We must all pay attention. We cannot all participate in government, but we must pay attention. We must see what is going on. We must ask and scrutinize. We must say what exactly is going on here. If we don't, the Commonwealth would have disappeared long before we are aware. So it's important for us to pay attention. Now how can we then make sure that we do not return to the years of mindless looting of public resources that has impoverished us and endangered our future? The first is to deal with grand corruption. And that is one of the first things that the Buhari administration did. And I'm not talking, and I want to just emphasize that I'm not talking about the corruption, somebody is taking, policemen are taking, corrupt, uh, taking bribes. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the direct looting of the treasury. And you need to deal with that first. 
If you don't deal with that, we will not have the resources to do the big things that need to be done. Second is the investment in infrastructure. No country that seeks to develop and prosper can afford to treat infrastructure with non challenge And so it is important for us to put our resources into infrastructure. As of today, as I pointed out earlier, in two budget cycles, despite earning 60% less, we are investing 2.7 trillion on capital. And I've said this is the highest in the history of the country. The next question, of course, is what is the impact? Where is the impact of that spending? And that's a good question. And, uh, and I'll, I'll answer that right away. Building infrastructure, as you know, is like laying a foundation for a skyscraper. You must drill downwards, lay your piles for a, for a year, two years in some cases. At that time, people don't see the building yet, but the foundation laying is going on. Here in Ibadan, for example, some of you might have seen the railway line. There's a Lagos Canal railway line, but the first phase of that Lagos Canal railway line, this is a standard gauge railway line. The first phase of that railway line starts from the Apapa port in Lagos, and and of course all the way to Ibadan. That's the first phase. We expect that we'll be able to see the completion of of the first phase getting to Ibadan by January of 20 uh, of 2019. We started constructing in 2017. And the project, of course, is making good progress. When it is completed, not only will goods be able to move from their papa port all the way to Kano, you know, for now it will move from Lagos to Ibadan and then, you know, to the hinterland. But also, it will provide passenger transport for those who want to come from uh, one end of our country to the other. At the, at the moment, also in Abuja, after 15 years of contracting left and contracting right, we have completed and commissioned the Abuja Light Rail. That project starts from the airport and goes to the city center. So the Abuja Light Rail has been officially commissioned. It is now running a free service. And by the time, uh, I think it's next month, that will, that will then begin to run a commercial uh, service. Aside from that, the Abuja Kaduna Railway was also completed in, in 2016. And that is a very, very effective railroad between Abuja and Kaduna. It takes about an hour, 20 minutes uh, between Abuja and Kaduna. Now, in addition to that, here in the southwest, of course, work is going on on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. And we need to ask ourselves, how come Lagos Ibadan Expressway has been there all these many years? It needed to have been sorted out. It just wasn't. Years have gone by. And it still is. And this is the major artery, the major outlet for Lagos, uh, for, from the commercial city of Nigeria out to the rest of the country. There is the Lagos Otabe Okuta Expressway, Ikorodu Shadamo Road, etc., Obomosho Elonye Road, the Maiduguri Potakot Rail, and Wari Alaja Rail, which is very important, especially for our, for our iron ore. These are infrastructure projects that are going on today. In order of these infrastructure projects, we have to take counterpart funding for them. The Chinese are giving us money for the Lagos Kano, and we are providing our own 15% counterpart. So it's a long-term loan. They are also doing the same for the Lagos Calabar Railway. We cannot, without borrowing, be able to complete these projects. We cannot. But the borrowing, and whenever you borrow, it must be for infrastructure. It must be for something that is going to, that, that will conduce to progress in the economy. You can't borrow to pay salaries. You can't borrow to, you know, to spend on recurrent. It has to be capital. And this is, what, uh, th this is what the government has tried to do. On power, we've moved generation from 4,000 to 7,000 megahertz. But there are major constraints with transmission and distribution. Unfortunately, the discos, private owners of the distribution facilities, have not necessarily had the resources, especially to, to, uh, to invest in distribution. But we've taken that on. And through the TCN and the Niger Delta Power Holding Company, we are completing transmission projects around the country. But the more important strategy is to decentralize power production. So we've adopted an off-grid program, which means that we're encouraging private in investors to collaborate with government to build 
independent power plants and supply power to willing buyers. This was made possible by what is called uh, an eligible customer declaration made by the Ministry of Power, Works and Housing. By this collaboration, we've been providing power, especially solar power, to economic clusters, especially markets across the country. What, 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 what that means is that we've been doing a fair number of power projects, especially solar power projects, in markets across the country, providing power, solar power to those markets. And of course, that is much cheaper, much cheaper than biofuels, much cheaper than all the other sources of power that we found. Our area market in Abba, for instance, about 31,993 shops. Sabongari market in Kano, about 13,500 shops. Sura market in Lagos, 1,047 shops. Isika market in Ondo, Bagi here in, in Oyo State. Now, in total, we've done about 81,000 of these shops, servicing about 320,000 SMS, MSMEs so far. Yesterday in Lagos, we commissioned the Sura Market Solar Project. Businesses there now have a 24-hour power supply. From printers, commercial tailors to small shops, everyone is employing more and making more profit. If we stick to that agenda, in the next two years, we will see the most significant improvements in our power sector. In providing jobs and opportunities for the future, another area of focus is agriculture. Agriculture has been a major story because we've increased budgetary allocation to agriculture. In 2015, the total budgetary allocation to agriculture was 8.8 .8 billion. In 2016, we moved that up to 46.2 billion. And in 2017, the last budget, we moved it to 103.8 billion. Through the Anchor Borrowers Program, and this is credit given directly to smallholder farmers, through the CBN and 13 banks, we've also put in about 120 billion to 720,000 smallholder farms, cultivating 12 commodities, including rice, wheat, cotton, soya beans, cassava, poultry, and groundnuts across the 36 states. The importance of our agricultural project is that, first, it creates opportunities, several opportunities for young people, for those who want to involve themselves in farming, and the whole agro allied value chain. And to support that, we launched a fertilizer program in collaboration with the Kingdom of Morocco. Today we have 11 fertilizer blending plants with a capacity of 2.1 million metric tons. Price of fertilizers then dropped from about 13,000 per bag to somewhere in the order of about 5,500 to 7,000 per bag. Now, one of the very important things is that with the ramping up of agriculture, we now have a situation where within the next few months, we should be self-sufficient in rice production. We were producing, but we were buying $5 million of rice every single day. $5 million a day of rice. That's the amount of importation. Today, we are down to 2% of those imports. We're down to 2% of those imports. By focusing on agriculture, we know that this is an area where there is a great deal of opportunities, especially for young people, not even necessarily in participating in farming itself, but several of the opportunities around technology that we have seen, especially in the last few years. I'll give you a few examples. Farm crowding is, 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 an, is a small company formed by young men and women, all of them under the age of 35. It's a digital agricultural portal that crowdsources funding for farms across Nigeria. It was founded in 2016 by Onyeka Akuma and three other young Nigerians. It works a bit like a mutual fund, pulling together money from multiple investors to establish farms and hire smallholder farmers to cultivate them and then paying the investors dividends from the harvest from these farms. In December 2017, it raised a million dollars in funding. So this is one of the very creative, innovative ways by which young people are not only investing in farming, but investing for others in farming. 
are making money for themselves and making money for their various investors. Four years before farm crowd, in 2012, a lady called EMC, sorry, EMC in Rondoye, founded Soldier, a cassava processing company in the rural town of Adu'awai in, in, in the southwest here, more than 200 kilometers from Lagos. The starch that that farm produces from processed cassava is now being used by several leading Nigerian food manufacturing companies, including Nestle, Unilever, and Nigerian breweries, as increasingly replace imported starch with locally produced varieties. Southway is one of those com uh, companies that found growth opportunities even in the midst of the recession, as companies cut down their imports. In 2015, its revenues grew threefold, and in 2016, it began building a second production line. Another young Nigerian, Kola Masha, the Bangona, is the name of his company. What he does is that he supports smallholder farmers in northern Nigeria with financing, with agricultural input, with training and marketing. And he's leveraging his experience in the private uh, sector in particular and changing the life of several thousands of struggling farmers. There's another small company called Fresh Direct by a very young Nigerian also, I don't even believe she's 30, Angel Adiraja. She has perfected an innovative approach to farming using disused containers without soil and very little water. And what she's doing is probably going to be the beginning of an urban farming revolution in Nigeria. The interesting thing about all of this is that young people have an edge where technology is concerned. And a lot of young people are bringing their cutting edge knowledge of technology to bear on several different businesses. And I have no doubt that some people sitting here in this room might even take up the, the advantage of some of these opportunities. And the opportunities are growing every day. An area where we've, where, where we've launched some of the most aggressive drives is the tech space. The future of jobs is in technology and innovation. We've partnered with local and international technology companies in the building of tech hubs and promoting innovation. Our aim is to democratize access to innovation and cyber commerce and create jobs. In September 2017, we hosted Mark Zuckerberg, the founder and CEO of Facebook, at the Arso Villa Demo Day. And after that event, we went on to partner with the World Bank to launch a business plan for young entrepreneurs who participated in the qualifying stages of that competition. At the end of the competition, we selected 81 beneficiaries, to which we disbursed the total sum of 700 million in grants. Now, funding, as you can imagine, is key to practically every one of these things. And this is the reason why now the Bank of Industry has set up a technology fund of 10 billion naira for startups. And this is managed, as I've said, essentially by the Bank of Industry. And then the Development Bank of Nigeria, they are also working with international financial institutions and the central bank to provide low-cost funding to technology. Now, there is so much, there's so much that can be done in the area of technology and so much that is being done. I have been personally to about 11 or 12 different technology hubs in Nigeria, and we are collaborating with these hubs. In these hubs, there are young Nigerians who are working on different forms of innovation, different forms of innovative technology. In Yola, we have some who are the humanitarian hub there. In Edo State, we've seen some incredible work going on. I was just in Genesis Hub in Enugu State. There are so many all over the country, and so much that's going on. We're collaborating with Civic Hub, which is in Abuja, and they are doing what is called the Universities Challenge. The Universities Challenge is Students' Innovation Challenge, and I hope there are people here who are participating in that in the six geopolitical zones. And what they're doing is that we're looking at the best innovations coming from the different universities. Those innovations will, be, will then be backed by funding. The best innovations will be backed by funding, funding from the Bank of Industry and the Central Bank of Nigeria. 
so that we can get the very best of those innovations, grow them into businesses, and they can attract jobs. But let me just give you a few examples of some of what we're seeing already in terms of jobs, in terms of technology companies that are providing jobs. In the fintech space in, in particular, payment, you know, uh, in, in the uh, payment systems, there is so much that's going on. I'll just give you just two examples. Space time. I'm, I'm sure some may have heard of Paystack. This is a safe payment system which offers seamless money transactions between customers. It was established in 2016 by two young Nigerians and the alumni of Babcock University, Shola Akinla and Ezra Ulubi. Within the first three months of 2018, they have processed over 3 billion and they're generating 40 billion naira annually for Nigerian businesses. The company is today powering over 9,000 businesses that did not exist two years ago. Paystack has over 50 employees. All of them are under 35 years old. All of the employees, including the founders. There is also Andela. I don't know how many have heard of Andela. And this is a multinational company specializing in training software developers. What they do is they just train software developers was co-founded by a Nigerian, Inye Aboyeji. Inye is not even 30 years old yet. And the company estimates that in 10 years, and this is what they are working on, there will be 1.3 million software development jobs and only 40,000 computer science graduates to fill them. So they are saying, by their projections, there will be, there will be 1.3 million software development jobs. Those jobs are already coming up. But, there will only be 40,000 trained hands to, 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 uh, to get those jobs. So there's clearly a huge vacuum in terms of competent young individuals who can take up these jobs. The company's uh, vision is to change the future of Nigeria and the Af African continent. And they're looking and, and, and getting talent from everywhere. Today, the company has about 1,000 employees worldwide. The truth of the matter is that no matter how you look at it, Technology is where the great opportunities are. And you find technology in the creative arts as well. Already Warner Brothers is, has come to Nigeria looking for persons who are skilled in animated cartoons. One of the things we're doing with our Empire program is that we're training 15,000 persons in, in, in the skills required for animation. We're training 15,000 of them. And already there are about five or six businesses around animated cartoons. The scope of opportunity is huge. And our business as government is to support that as much as possible. Our technology agenda is premised on our new education curriculum, which emphasizes STEAM, not STEM, but STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. We are currently developing that curriculum especially the science, technology, and engineering, and math aspect of it, with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, with Cisco Academy, with IBM, and with the Oracle Academy. But that nationwide curriculum is one that we expect will incorporate 20, 21st century uh, STEAM thinking, namely in things like coding, design skills, digital arts, robotics, machine learning, and so on. The curriculum will cover primary to secondary education with the skills that are necessary to equip young people for the coming years. The arts component of that vision is also extremely important to us. Visual arts, dance, music, film and theatre, comedy, literature and so many more fields. I think that Nigeria has proved to the world that we have the talent and originality and ambition. But what is important is that that talent and originality, that ambition, must be turned to cash, it must be turned to jobs. Without turning it to cash and jobs, without the skills required to do so, it will just be talent. And that is one of the reasons why, especially for technology and entertainment, the president asked that we set up a special advisory group of major players in technology and entertainment in order to advise on policy and to develop policy. Policy has to change and is changing very quickly in those fields. But in order to do so effectively, we need to have these young men and women 
who are out there doing this business in the policy groups. I have the privilege of chairing that uh, technology and creativity advisory group and we've been working on various policies and projects. Just as an example, the payment systems that we have, all these payment companies, companies that are facilitating payments, many of them are competing with banks. So the banks are saying, you don't have banking licenses, but you are competing with us. So we need to develop policies for payment systems. We need to develop policies for fintech companies. The banks can't hold innovation down. They can't stop innovation. They can't tell us that we must go back to the past. But we must also ensure that we regulate anybody who is involved in payment systems, not only to prevent uh, unfair competition, but also to ensure that these are systems that have integrity and they're systems that will not end up robbing Nigerians of their, of their hard-earned resources. So there's a lot of work going on at the Technology and Creativity uh, Advisory Group, a lot of uh, very interesting conversations going on and a lot of young people who are involved in the whole process of developing policy. The third and final aspect of what I will talk about is the social investment program. Now the social investment program is the largest and most ambitious social protection program in the history of Nigeria. We provided for it 500 billion in both the 2016 and 2017 budget. But what we've been able, what we spent so far is 20 250 billion from both budgets. The program has four components. The Empower program, which is a graduate employment scheme, and that's the largest tertiary job project in Africa. We are employing at the moment 500,000 graduates, and they are recruited as teachers, agriculture extension workers, and as public health officials. Each of these volunteers is provided with an electronic tablet containing relevant training materials, including some which they, are, which they use for their own personal training, personal self-development, and some which they use on the job. So when, but we, at the moment we've given to just over 200,000, to over 200,000 have electronic tablets. The remaining 300,000 have just been onboarded, they were onboarded in August, so we have a total number of 500,000 graduates who are under uh, the Empire program. But that device is very important. That tablet is important because it not only helps in personal development of the, uh, of the, uh, of the beneficiaries, it also helps them to do their own businesses. Many of them are working as data collectors. They are working as analysts. Many are, are involved in service, different service uh, across the country. So there's a lot of work going on and there's a lot of training. If you, if, they tra if you look at what is contained in their devices, they're able to learn coding, they're able to learn some measure of robotics, entrepreneurial training and all that. And that's the kind of material that's contained in, uh, in, in, their, in the uh, tablets that they have. We also have the Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program, G, where loans ranging from 50,000 to 350,000 are dispersed to over 300,000 traders, artisans, farmers across the 36 states. We intend to give a million loans under the, under the market money scheme or the chip scheme. I've talked already about the trader money scheme, which is the one for the uh, lowest in the pyramid, the one for the petty traders. And I've said that we're giving out 2 million loans. Now, one of the reasons why this is absolutely important is because you cannot create jobs without focusing on small businesses. Small businesses are the lifeblood of the economy of any nation. It's not the big businesses. It's the businesses that are able to employ one, two, up to ten people. If you're able to do millions of those kinds of businesses, then you can truly have your GDP improving at a rate that will be much faster than if you had a few uh, large companies because the small companies provide the jobs. So the focus is on giving credit to these small companies. A lot of the credit is direct intervention because the banking system, as you know, most loans coming out of the banks are far too expensive. So what we've tried to do is to give direct intervention through the BOI, through the GIP, which is the uh, Government Enterprise and Empowerment Scheme. And then the ones that are being given directly 
to the trader money uh, to the trader money people. Of course, what we found also is that with giving money to the small uh, to the small uh, businesses, they're able to open bank accounts. They're able to come into into the formal economy. In fact, so far in a, a short period of about 18 months, we've opened about close to 500,000 new bank accounts and wallets for beneficiaries and intending beneficiaries. So in conclusion, Nigeria's future lies in the hands of the youth. But that future is already here. Our role is to ensure that we deliver the environment that makes that possible. And when I say our role, I speak about government, the public sector in particular. To young people, my message is that you must be vigilant and you must hold your leaders to account. You must take time to study the facts, take time to scrutinize the arguments, and take time to question the arguments. The future truly belongs to you. There's no need for anybody to argue that because the future is all about you. But that future can only be guaranteed by your own vigilance and by making sure that those you have entrusted with power use that power only for the benefit of the people of our great country. Thank you.